Broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. All right, Let's Talk Freight is right. Welcome back. Episode 162 of the Freight 360 Podcast. Ben, how you doing, man? What's going on? It's freezing down here, man. I like had to put almost had to put socks and shoes on this morning. It was like sixty-eight oh degrees. Oh my god! I don't even want to hear it. Let me look at the the actual. So we record on Wednesdays. Current temperature is forty-three. I think it was thirty-eight last night here. So good lord! But you know, yeah. I did actually. I did see that because I'm going to um, Florida in a couple weeks, and I saw I was looking at like the long range forecast, and I saw it was like. 50 this morning or something in Orlando. So yeah, it was 60. It's 64 right now, but it's rainy. I mean, you just notice it drastically like when the humidity just drops off during fall and then it gets a little bit of rain. Like it's really cold for me, but again, coming off of 95 degrees, 24 hours a day for three months, like anything below 90 seems cold. <laughs> well, that's it, man. It's, it's, all, it's all relative. You know what I mean? If you're mm-hmm. like, for example, when I, <clears throat> spent a year in the Middle East, deployed with the army, and I I came home in August, right? And it was like 120 degrees over there in August. And I come home and it, still it was like high 70s in Buffalo, 80, but like you still feel the difference. You're like, I'm not used to it not being that temperature. So you get acclimated yep. and it is what it is. It's like, um, you know, for example, when I go to Florida in a couple of weeks, I'll leave Buffalo where it's probably going to be in 40s or 50s and I'll get down there. It'll be like almost 80. So It'll feel warm. It'll feel nice. But other than that, anything cool and fun, interesting going on? Not particularly. Um, Got some interesting thing that happened with one of my really large accounts that we could chat a little bit about. Um, I'm a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. Got, Got a text message yesterday from like one of my largest carriers that my customer reached out to them directly about the specific business that I do with my customer. Ooh. Carrier called me, sent me a text message with a screenshot of that, right? You know, immediately called me like, what's going on here? And my carrier doesn't want to work directly with the company. And for one of the reasons we talk a lot about this on our show, right? And one of the main reasons they don't want to work directly with that customer is because of pay terms. They pay late. They don't pay it at all, right? Sometimes they had invoices that were over a year before they were getting paid. So again, One of the, you know, the big services we provide, among other things, is the cash flow to the carrier. So they have no interest in working directly with the customer. But again, really interesting scenario because like my points of contact that I spoke to yesterday were like, yeah, look, there's some issue with procurement. They want to eliminate all of the brokers that we're working with, like every one of them. Well, the people, you know, that actually deal with the trucks and the capacity and get yelled at when things aren't getting moved are like, we don't have enough capacity. Like, we need the brokers. And they were like, you literally have the highest, you know, on time percentage of anybody we work with in the whole company. This is like one of the largest shippers in the country, like enormous. And they're like, you know, like we don't, we don't want to lose you. So, but procurement, the people at the end of the day that just look at the budgets are trying to find ways to save money. So, you know, as of yesterday, like I thought I lost like an entire account, you know, well, thankfully, and still hopefully, like I spoke to procurement this morning and they were like, no, we're getting you set up in a new internal TMS system. It'll be better for you guys. So we got flagged. Every broker got flagged as they transitioned everybody into this TMS that they want to operate out of, as opposed to, you know, sending, you know, tenders over email and stuff. But yeah, like, I mean, one, like, that's why we talk about it. Like you need to have a lot of customers no matter how good you're doing, even when your customer loves the service, right? At the end of the day, it might not be their choice to not work with you. You know, somebody from above, somebody in the budget office or the CFO might say, look, I don't care if our service suffers. We want to save the money. That's more important to us. And at the end of the day, not much you can do about that. That's interesting. There's probably some, and we can get into it more in a little bit here, but there's probably some back solicitation clause you have in a contract with the carrier too, that would prevent them from, from doing that. And, um, Crazy, crazy stuff. Well, anyway, um, this episode is bl- brought to you by Blue Book Services. Blue Book is the resource you need if you're transporting fresh produce. 
Their online database contains thousands of companies throughout the produce industry supply chain. You can easily search their database to generate new sales leads. Blue Book's credit ratings help you avoid companies with high credit risk, and their team can help resolve disputed loads. To learn more, go to ProduceBlueBook.com and click join today. That's ProduceBlueBook.com. I just thought about something that I got going on this week. So we record Wednesdays. Tomorrow's Thursday. I have to, um, I'm being deposed in a lawsuit from TQL against my former employer. I thought that was uh, Monday. I thought you already were deposed. No, no? Monday was my prep. So I oh, had to prep for the attorneys depot. for a couple hours to go through all the evidence yeah. that TQL um, got during the discovery phase. So basically they pulled up emails that I wrote. And I mean, we're going back like six, seven years for the stuff that they're pulling up. Uh, but basically they're TQL. The whole thing comes down to like the non-compete situation with former TQL people that had then moved to the company I worked for. And I'm curious to report back on the outcome of all of this. I don't think we're going to find out anytime soon. Essentially what they're doing now is they're deposing everybody to get them on the record. And then, um, you know, if needed, you know, there's a potential that we would have to take the stand in a trial to, uh, you know, to speak to what happened. But yeah, it's, uh, it should be interesting. Cause I think there's, I'm going to be meeting with TQL's attorneys tomorrow, the attorneys, the attorneys that are representing me. And then, uh, is, is it a stenographer, whoever like types out everything? Yeah. So what I'm doing, it's, what's interesting is they just happen to the, the, the depositions are all happening in Orchard Park. So um, they're like, hope, you know, it's not too far of a drive for you. And I was like, I live in Orchard Park. So, but you got people that are driving, you know, they got to drive like 40 yeah. minutes to, you know, because everyone that's in, the, that's in the Buffalo area is all getting deposed in the same place. So well, let uh, me know if you see Chris Brown there tomorrow. Everybody that's ever worked at TQL and no longer works there has gotten a little personalized letter from Chris Brown reminding them of their obligations to TQL and the non-compete. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I should have kept it. No, so there's, there's literally one of the evidence emails, as I think as an email from him to the company I worked for telling us to stay away from their employees. Yeah. So, but yeah, that, that name rang about when you said it. So yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to keep you posted, but let's talk. Give, some me, a sports real quick. What's that? Yeah, give me a call after that. Cause I'm really anxious to hear how that goes. No, no. <laughs> but yeah. And the they, sports, they, yeah. Group win, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they said, so tomorrow, anyway, finish that up four hours. They're expecting my deposition to be so nine o'clock to one o'clock, but yeah, sports, we got a group win here. Steelers. I don't know how the heck you guys pulled that off. Nice to see Brady lose. Oh Great my to see goodness. the Steelers win. You know what? I was thinking about how to talk sports today. It was just a weird, weird weekend around the NFL. So I got to pull up the, the scores here to refresh myself. As you're um, doing that, I love, did you see the meme um, of Brady yelling at the linemen? And it just says, um, I lost my family for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that, but that's funny. Oh, good stuff. All right. So going all the way back to Thursday, the Thursday game of week six, um, Washington and Chicago, right? Thursday night football has yet to have any freaking good games. And Amazon Prime has the contract this year, 12 to seven. What a boring game. Um, it was just so strange. Then, um, obviously, Buffalo Bills, they made a statement by beating the Chiefs in Arrowhead on Sunday afternoon, 24 to 20. I was very happy about that. That game, I think I projected it. I said it's going to be a close one, right? Um, yeah. But the Bills pulled it off, and they did. So I personally took the spread three and a half or two and a half on that game. So that was another another win for me there. Uh, but some speaking other weird the, games. Speaking of the Bills, where did you get that chart that's behind you, right? Oh, where did you get it. the paper for that? Is that like written on the same paper they wrote the Constitution? It's a it's a board. It's like wood. Ah, that's so why. Okay. The story behind it is my the last house I lived in, we had a, a TV on our patio that I and I built like a like an enclosure box with swing doors on it. Mm -hmm. So we would go outside and watch the Bills games. And when it was cold, we'd have like a heater lamp out there. But so inside the swing doors, we started to write down this like schedule and the, the scores. Yeah. So we had like 2020, 2021. Then we moved here and I don't have an outdoor patio. I have this finished basement now. So I was like, we need this thing so like got, got this piece of wood i cut it into the right size and i have it all chopped up for the next four years 
and uh, five and one. It's got the, you know, all the scores recorded on it. Uh, but back to some other weird, weird games. Um, the Jets beat the Packers. So when that one o'clock Jets game was over, the Bills knew if they lost to Kansas City, the Jets would be in first place in the division. That's it's just insane. insane to think about. But the Bills pulled it off. Um, what what else here? The Bengals, Saint, uh, Giants beat the Ravens. That was an interesting one. But the Steelers beating the Bucks twenty eighteen. Man, that was yeah. would never have thought that. Um, Eagles Cowboys. That was an entertaining <clears throat> one to watch uh, Sunday night. And then Broncos Chargers Monday. Chargers came away with the win nineteen uh, sixteen. So that's a tough division. It's so a weird score. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very weird. Oh, here's the controversy too. So if anyone does like DraftKings or whatever, um, they periodically do like a – they offer like a a boost, they call it. So they'll take like a ridiculously favored bet and they'll boost the odds so your payout's better. And they had the, – the, the bet was like Justin Herbert to score at least one touchdown. And the odds of it are normally minus 800, which means like – You've got to put up eight hundred dollars if you want to win a hundred dollars, or eight dollars yeah. to win one. So they boosted yep. it into an even payout. So a dollar would pay out a dollar. They usually cap those too, though, don't they? Yeah, twenty five bucks. Yeah. So I hopped on it, and like everyone I know hopped on it. Justin Herbert has thrown a touchdown in all but one game in his entire season or his entire career, and Monday night became the second time it ever happened. So everyone's <laughs> like, "It's rigged." He didn't throw a single touchdown. So like literally. They they expected um, somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four million dollars is what they assumed DraftKings won on that. So that's nuts for that one bet. So anyway, good to be a bookie. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll give my predictions. Uh, well, the Bills have a bye week next week, but or this weekend. But I'll give my predictions on some other games at the end of the episode. Let me make my timestamp here for our buddy that likes to skip through it, and uh, we'll get into the meat and potato of the episode. But let's give a shout out to our friends over at DAT. Take the guesswork out of freight with DAT. The DAT Load Board Network is the largest on-demand freight marketplace in North America, connecting freight brokers with available capacity on any lane. Grow your business with tools that allow you to find new business partners, plus you can quickly qualify and onboard new carriers. And with the industry's leading freight rate data, you can make clear and confident pricing decisions. Check out the show notes if you are adding to your licenses or signing up for DAT for a free month of Power Express or Trucker's Edge. Absolutely. So I know we kind of went on a long rant there about sports in our personal lives, but what's interesting is that ties into today's episode, which is all about how to, you know, it's we're talking about cold calling and people often ask like, how should, how should I start a cold call? What should I say? What should I be doing? All of that. And I have a couple of bullet points here that we're going to cover today in no particular order, but we're going to talk about the actual things that you want to say, um, how you can actually present your pitch or your services as a freight broker, how to build that rapport and also use your personality. And one of the things that I think you and I both do very well, we, we try to help other folks with, whether it's coaching or just general advice is take advantage of that awesome personality that you've got, right? You know, if, if you... If you're working in freight brokerage, you are a salesperson, whether or not you want to call it that. This is a sales job, right? And if you do not have, if you don't enjoy building rapport and having a personality and having conversations, you're probably in the wrong industry. Uh, So you might want to rethink that. But one of the things that I think can project you and help you excel, you know, leaps and bounds in this industry is to use that to your advantage to build rapport with shippers. Because we always say it, people do business with those that they know and they like, and they trust, and they're going to like you based on how they feel after they have a conversation with you. Okay. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. So the, the opening of any cold call, all right, or maybe it's, maybe you got a referral or maybe you've emailed the person first, but anyway, it's the first time that you're talking to them on the phone. It is extremely important for you to be in a relaxed state where you're not like tense or nervous or out of breath because you just ran up three flights of stairs to the office or whatever, but you want to be in a good zone. You want to be in a good mood. Maybe you want to stand if that's your preference, have a smile on your face when you're, when you're dialing those, those digits Uh, and just start off with a really, really good positive vibe and really good high energy because nobody wants to be on one of those super lame, boring calls. Like you get those surveys or like people ask you if you're going to vote in the election or, 
you know, all these things like to donate to their organization. And it's just, hello, this is so, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, you can't, you can't go into it like that. So um, did you have any, like, I don't want to call it a ritual, but anything that you would do before a call to get you, get your mindset right? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't necessarily do anything other i mean like i used to have a mirror in front of me that i would look at to smile i would usually have a sign that had a smiley face above my phone that would remind me and that sounds really simple and i mean i had this the only time in fact this is the first office i didn't have it in so like every sales job i had that in and the main reason was what you were just saying right you're dealing with some issue or something blows up and you're dealing with a carrier and it's a different tone of voice right and it's a different aspect of your job when you're prospecting, if you aren't happy and energetic, right? I would just say like, nobody wants to do business with Eeyore, right? Oh, poo. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, and again, it also takes more energy to talk to somebody. Like, you ever hear like the expression, like, it's like pulling teeth talking to this person, right? Like, yeah. it literally like almost sucks your energy out of you, right? <clears throat> and I would say like, one of the more difficult things in sales are the days you show up and you don't feel like it, right? The days where you're in a good mood and you just closed a big deal or brought on a new customer, that's when it's the easiest to get on the phone. So we would always say like, hey, if you get a win, jump back on the call and keep trying to carry that momentum because you've got the energy, you're in a good mood and you're in a good place. Now, the days where you come in and you feel like shit and you didn't sleep well or you're hungover or whatever, there's an accident on your way to work, your kid didn't sleep, whatever it was, right? Those are definitely the more difficult days. And I used to putt golf balls. Like I had a putting green. I actually had a net too, where I could hit golf balls into it right behind my desk at TQL. And I would do that before I'd prospect to just get my mindset. It would help me get away from whatever else I was doing. It would put me into a good mood and then I could sit down and then I would go at it. I So I, I didn't, well, I guess I did putt golf balls years back when I was at an office where they had like a little, one of the guys had like a putter and a mm -hmm. little thing. But the another office I was at when we had moved to a different location, we had a warehouse and we would go walk. Like we would just take laps around the warehouse, just yep. get the blood flowing, get the, you know, drink coffee, drink monster, whatever. You want to make sure that, you know, there's the phrase fake it so you make it. But, you know, if you are literally physically tired you gotta do whatever you can to boost your energy level up well here's a t and here's a couple either easier tips too one that's a great one so i always used to say like that's the main reason why i've always had a wireless headset in sales i've never sat down doing this job ever i'm always walking when i'm talking like if i'm on the phone with a prospect or doing that side of the sales job i'm never sitting down i'm always standing up and i'm always moving the other thing is you can trick your brain. It works one way, but not the other. So you can you could act your way into a different behavioral state. Meaning if you really feel down or upset, there is a technique where like if you write a pen, it uses the same muscles you use when you smile. And it literally sends the same message to your brain that it does when you smile. And it will literally make you smile. And it will like literally change your mood, right? If and I learned this listening and not watching on YouTube. Ben did just put a pen in his mouth, which is why he sounded that way. <laughs> yeah. But, and also like it, you, if you notice when you do it, like I, I learned this from a sales guy that used to sell door to door, like knocked on, you know, thousands of doors in his career. And it's hard. It rains some days. Like there are definitely tough days in that. Right. And they used to use that constantly. He's like, always had a pen in my pocket. You get beat up on one door knock or a sales call. And you got to go to the next one. You got to find some way to get that energy back up again. And I mean, it does work. It sounds cheesy, but it's effective. So let's kind of go into what, how we can actually open the call up. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I maintain my status and my belief that I personally am not a script person, but that being said, there's a lot of similar things that you can say to open up a call. Um, I would not recommend saying the same thing every single time, right? We, we always say, I kind of like make fun of the the people that say, hi, this is John from ABC Logistics and I have trucks in your area. You know, like it's, it's so you sound robotic. Yes. You sound like every other person out there that's two weeks into their job making that phone call. So I'm always a big fan of like a very short opening, like, Hey, is this so-and-so? Or if they say their name, right. You, you hop right to the next step, which is, Hey John, it's Nate over at blah, blah, blah. You could say, how's it going or how's your day or just leave yep. it right at that and let them respond. 
right? Do you have any uh, my go to opener? So mine is I always start with something that's in it for them, give them some reason to want to be on the phone. So whether it's I share a customer that they have, maybe, maybe it's that I'm shipping for one of their competitors, maybe I'm shipping for one, you know, one of their peers in the industry. Um, or I know you always laugh, but I probably use that one the most that I'm sending trucks into their area. But the thing is, you can, say, you can say it in a I way that doesn't sell. sound terrible. right. Mine is going to be, hey, Nate, I was giving you a buzz real quick. To be honest, look, I don't even know if we'd be a fit to work together, but I'm sending like five, 10 trucks down into your neck of the woods on a weekly basis for another customer I have. And these drivers are constantly grabbing spot loads to run back up to where they load again. And I was just, honestly, I want to see if maybe we'd be a fit. I don't know if we would or not. And then I'm usually pausing. I'm giving them some reason to want to talk to me. And I'm in, I'm implying that there's probably going to be a discount because there's a backhaul. When a shipper hears backhaul, they're thinking a little less than a front haul rate. Maybe it should be cheaper, right? And I'm giving them some reason to want to talk to me. And then well, immediately after, I push back a little bit because you're creating some pressure in the sales call and I want to release it right after. I want to point out two things <laughs> that are similar in both things that we just said there, right? Our tone of voice and our energy was, I think, really, really good. It was high. Um, we didn't sound tired. We didn't sound depressed or down. We were enthusiastic and we seemed very upbeat. The other part is we, we said something that kind of piqued their interest or caused them to be a little curious, right? So like in my case, they're probably like, who's this guy? Why is he calling? And in your case, they're like, backhaul. So he's not just saying he's got trucks in there. He's mentioned backhaul. And he's even telling me he doesn't even know if we're a good fit to work together. Like it kind of, it starts to make them think it throws them out of their normal thought process when they get those cold calls day after day after day. Yep. And here's the thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this too. So like I, I've talked about this technique of going for no, but the other analogy is like releasing the pressure. So anytime there's a cold call or a sales scenario, right? There is inherent pressure. So I always use this example. Um, when was the last time you went into a department store to buy something? Anything specific, like a dress shirt or like a blazer for a wedding? Like you knew yeah, where you I, were going to go. What was it? Yeah, I, I bought a suit before I went to DC a few weeks ago. Perfect. So again, you walk into, we'll say Macy's, right? You walk into Macy's and somebody inevitably walks right up to you and says what? Hi, is there anything I could help you with? And you inevitably said what? No, thanks. I'm just looking. Right. Now, the interesting thing is when you think about that, they would have helped you find it. It would have made your life easier. You would have wasted less time and probably got the product much quicker. But again, everybody always says that. And why do you think they say that? They probably just want to get that person away from them. Right. And the thing is, as human beings, right, we love to buy shit right? Retail therapy. We like the aspect of purchasing something. It gives us a dopamine hit and then we feel good. So we like to buy things, but we hate to feel sold. And the main reason for that is we have a desire to come to that conclusion on our own volition, right? Like mm -hmm. we do not want to feel as if we were influenced or convinced to do something on behalf of somebody else. We want to know that it was like our decision, right? So inherently, there's that pressure there. And it makes us so uncomfortable that we literally tell them we won't need their help, even though we clearly do, right? So when that play, where that shows its face in a sales call is anytime you are basically asking for something or talking about what you need, you're increasing that pressure, right? Yep. So as soon as I do that, you can feel the tension. And I immediately release it by saying, Look, and it's true. I don't know if we'd be a good fit. I don't know where their rates are. I don't know where their procurement is. I don't know what their service is like. I don't know if they care about their service. I don't know any of these things yet. So it's it's authentic. And I'm honest when I say that. Like, look, I think this could work. I think it's worth us having a conversation. But again, I don't even know if we're a good fit just like you don't. So now yeah. I've made this much more conversational and way less pressure in the scenario, in the situation. Yeah. So I, you know, once you have that enthusiastic, positive opening and you introduced yourself and have that first little bit of uh, conversation, then you, it's kind of like the, remember those books, the goosebumps books where it was like, choose yeah. your own adventure. So now you get to play a little game of choose your own adventure and um, kind of go into the first question that you want to ask. Right. Yep. And for, for 
everybody, it might be a different thing. For each customer, it might be different as well, depending on how much research you've done. Um, also, if you want to inject some personality and build rapport, maybe it's a good time to just throw a little question out there like, hey, so how was your weekend? Or what do you have coming up this weekend? Or did you catch the game last night? Or any yep. of that stuff. That's completely appropriate. Um, I know some people are totally against getting off topic in sales calls. I'm not that way. I I probably spend more time on a, on a sales call talking about things <laughs> other than business than I do about business. I will say that I think those people are wrong. And here's what I, I've seen in our industry is you're not going to be unsuccessful by only talking about business. But the reality is, is they will have to prospect probably 10 times the amount of people I will by taking that approach versus your or my approach. Meaning you'll still get business. People will still talk to you. And everybody that listens to this is probably like, well, I don't do that. And I have customers and I'm making money on some of these. And you're right. People will still do business with you. It just takes a lot longer to find the person that's willing to do business with somebody they have no trust and no rapport with. Right. And I want to add something here too. When you're working as a broker for a customer, you're more than likely not the only broker that they're working with. So there's a percentage of their business that you are getting. Now, when you can build rapport, establish a relationship, and you become that likable person, one of two things will likely happen. Either, number one, you will then get a larger piece of the pie, aka yep. they like you more than Johnny next door. So they're going to give you, throw you a couple lanes that he was working on previously. Or number two, when stuff pops up out of the ordinary, you're their first phone call or their first yes. email, right? Yep. And here's the other thing too, as it relates to rapport and trust, right? I always think of it like this, like nobody cares who you are and nobody cares who you work for and nobody cares what services you offer until you've given them a reason to care or yep. until you've earned the right like for them to care, right? And you've got to literally earn that. And you earn it by building the trust and a little bit of the rapport by getting that back and forth, right? Whether it's about the weather, whether it's about sports, whether it's about what they did last weekend, if it's Friday, what they're going to be doing this weekend, what they did last night, those are much lower hanging fruit to get somebody to start getting in the habit of answering the questions you ask, right? Because yep. in the beginning of a sales call, their guard's up here, right? They got a big wall up. They don't trust you. They don't know you. And you're bothering them in the middle of their day. Your first goal is to get that guard to come down a little bit and to get them in the habit of answering call, answering your questions, right? Just like everything else. As you start to talk to somebody and they answer, you get into a pattern, right? And then they're just going to start answering and you're going to ask and it's just going to fall into that rhythm, right? Yep. Um, one of the things I used to love to do is if someone like, obviously I'm big with sports and NFL, I would find out like where they are and try to drop some sort of like an insider sports thing on them. So like, dude, I talked to you from Cincinnati. I dropped a who day on him, mm -hmm. the big bangles thing there. Um, you know, there's all, all kinds of stuff. Like people, even people that cold call me about stuff, they're like, go bills. And I'm like, all right, I'll listen to this person. You know what I mean? Like I'll give them the time of day. But anyway, back to what we were saying in this conversation, you might be asking yourself, well, is every person seriously going to have this conversation with me? And the answer is no. No. You might catch a lot of people at a bad time. And they're like, hey, man, honestly, I'm swamped right yeah. now. I can't talk. What is and that's yeah. totally fine. That is part yeah. of the process. You get a lot of um, gatekeepers that they don't want to bullshit with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, you get uh, voicemails and all kinds of stuff. But the whole it's point of abilities, right? It's probabilities. You're more likely to be yes. successful. It doesn't mean you're going to be successful with every person you call in every instance by doing these. It's just yep. the percentage of success goes up. It's a, it is a huge numbers game. And if you've never seen the movie Moneyball, I highly recommend it because that, that breaks down statistics in baseball in a similar way that um, you know numbers happen in, in sales, especially when it comes to cold calling and freight broker. You, you have to go through a, a ton of pitches as a batter in the in the uh, major league baseball league in you know in order to get that batting average of 300 or yep. 315 or whatever and which means that you are literally only succeeding less than half the time well About there's a, that less than a third of the time the two famous ones in baseball right are babe ruth when he broke the home run record right also had the most strikeouts i think in like mlb that year and the other one is the it's the only sport where you know 
or I think it's the only thing you can make the Hall of Fame by doing it 30% of the time, right? You can hit 300, 30% of the time you make it into the Hall of Fame, right? Yeah, you're not going to see a Hall of Fame quarterback who's got a, a 30% completion percentage or a um, a golfer that hits par only 30% yeah. of the time or a, a basketball player that only Anything. hits free throws or uh, three-pointers 30% of the time. So, uh, But it's a numbers game. So, you know, other – so, okay, anyway, back to the, the sales call, right? This is a great time for you then to use a lot of those prospecting questions and open up with one that is general enough that you can pull out good information, but not too specific where it doesn't really make sense. So you're not going to hop in and say, um, how many LTLs are you shipping, right? You might say, hey, is this a busy time of year for you guys? Are you getting ramped up for a, you know another season? You kind of want to open it up generally and not be – way too specific. And you're right. And there's a reason for that too, that I found is that the more general the question, the more likely they are to answer, the more specific, the more they feel like they're giving you like proprietary information that the company protects and shipping lanes and shipping rates are protected by every shipper, right? They don't just divulge this to anybody that calls. So to ask the like coveted or the, the questions you really want answered, you can't start with those because usually they're going to be very guarded. So, but you can start with, and that's a great example. I always start high level because you also want to know when of their time of year, are they the busiest? When are they the slowest? When do they typically evaluate carriers? Do they have a bid process? Those are all things that are very easy to ask and very easy to have answered, right? Because they don't feel like they're giving out anything they shouldn't be. And that helps yeah. them get a habit too. It also tells you when you should be following up, right? should be following up with a carrier if it, they're dead in the fall and their peak is, you know, spring through summer, right? Like clearly. Yeah, so there is a level of relevance that needs to be had when you have, when you ask these questions. So for example, right. If, if you know a farm is harvesting potatoes in late or, you know, middle spring, don't call them in July and say, Hey, is this your busy time of year? Like you should know, Yes. at some level before you get on the call. The other thing too is think about where they are and what might have recently happened in their area that could be impacting the transportation, right? California. Hey, have you, have you guys been feeling any pressure, or any heat from the AB5 stuff that's yep. been taking place? Very general. And they might just spew out stuff. South or uh, the Western uh, side, of, the Gulf side of Florida, if I can get my words together here. Hey, have you guys, uh, how's things been going since the hurricane came through, right? Yep. General statement, but it's extremely relevant to where they are. Snowstorm comes through. Hey, how's everything been going since that blizzard rolled through? Right now, That's there's a powerful. cold snap that just came through like all of the Midwest. It froze over like Missouri, St. Louis, whole middle part of the country. Guess what? All those trucks that were supposed to show up that day came later, didn't come. And they're all having issues, right? And some of them probably couldn't get to work on time, right? So again, it gets them to start talking. It gets them in the habit of getting into the pattern of having a conversation, the back and yep. forth, right? So, so far we've done the hello, the introduce yourself and break the ice. The small talk. Right? And yeah. those are pretty much going to always happen on every single call. The difference is based on, and it's hard to, to talk about this if we're not on an actual call, but you have to be able to respond to how the other person's tone of voice is, right? If and you rate can of speech. Tell, yeah, if you can tell that like they sound super flustered, maybe you want to throw in one of those, hey, did I catch you at an okay time to, to chat? Ask you a couple questions, right? And they might yep. say, honestly, dude, I am swamped right now. It's not a good time. Okay, great. Because you're only going to piss them off if you just start ranting yes. and talking and talking and they can't be on the phone. And, so, And I think to go a little further, right, to just drive that point home, like – People in the South usually speak a little slower. If you're speaking to somebody in like New York, New Jersey, they tend to speak faster, right? You have a different, when you're speaking to people in like, um, oh, my mind just went blank, like Wisconsin, right? Like they're always very kind of folksy and very like happy and very pleasant, even when something's going wrong, right? There are different areas that have like different regions and different things in the way they kind of speak and the rate of speech, right? So you want to mirror that because that's also another really easy way to build rapport without even really knowing you're building rapport, right? When you are speaking yeah. similar to the way they are speaking, it makes them feel familiar and comfortable with you. That is something that I had to learn early on because clearly I'm a very fast paced 
speaker, right? Yes. People like people are like, you talk so fast. It's insane how much energy you have. I define myself meeting somebody where they are, right? So if yes. they are lower tone of voice and whatever, I'm going to lower my tone of voice, right? The way that I can use like inflections is going to be a little bit different, right? So if I want to pick up my voice a little bit or pick up the pace a little bit, where am I starting from? If I'm starting from a slower conversation or a lower tone conversation, I'm not going to be super crazy all of a sudden. But if I talk to someone yep. on the phone that is on my level or above my level, I got to catch up to them and get even more excited. And, yep. you know, so it's all, yeah, you know, it's, you got to bring them up, right? It's like dress code. Like they always used to say, like, you should dress for the position you want, not the position you have, like one notch above where you are. It's the same thing with speech. Like if their energy is here, a little bit above it. If it's here, yep. a little bit above that. You don't want to be so out of tone and out of touch with it that it makes them feel uncomfortable. Absolutely. So let's go through some of the, like the <coughs> ice breaking, or I don't want to say ice breaking, but the, how do we now that the wall is down, how can we ask some generalized questions? So the one that we already went through is about, Hey, is this, is this busy time for you guys? Have you, you know, is, have things been ramping up heavily or what, you know, what's business been looking like? Or you could even just say, you know, Hey, you know, if you know someone works in their transport, they, it is the right person. They're the one tendering freight. Hey, how's business been from you guys? What, what is your, what's your uh, volume of truckloads been looking like the last month or so? Very generalized. You're not asking mm -hmm. Hey, how many truckloads did you move last week? You're kind of keeping it general and yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's been a little bit slower, you know, versus how things were last year, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they'll just start, you know, in a good conversation, they'll just start giving you information and it's conversational. It's not like an interview because you don't want a sales call to be an interview. You want it to be, Hey, we're talking back and forth, like two people, we're building rapport, we're enjoying this conversation and I'm extracting information left and right as we go through this call. Absolutely. Right. Like I think about you start at high level and you kind of go down to more specific and then based on how they're responding, you know, if you can go further or come back up. Right. Yep. If I go and I'm, and I'm like, Hey, you know, asking them about the season. Hey, you know, is this kind of your busy time of year? How's it going into the fourth quarter? I know I was talking to Jimmy over at um, ABC supply and they were telling me they're really ramping up for the fourth quarter. You guys seeing some of the same stuff over there. Maybe I get an answer and then I'm going to go a little further. Yeah. On like on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, where are you guys at? Like 20, 40 loads a week, 40, 60, I don't know, 80 to a hundred, hundred to 300. And I'll usually keep grouping them and they'll usually stop me or you'll hear them chuckle and they'll usually correct you. But if you ask them specifically, how many full truckloads do you move this week? They're going to be hesitant to answer it. But if you give them options to choose from, you can at least gauge where they're at, usually on that scale. And they'll usually give you enough that you've got some idea. Because yeah. the biggest question we always get, right, is how do I know when to follow up? When do I call these people? Well, you know that based on the answers to the questions you're asking. If you're asking questions and you're finding out that things are ramping up and they're getting very busy and they're planning for the fourth quarter and they've got more inventory coming in, okay, I'm probably going to be following up pretty often now because we're at the time where they are likely to need brokerage help, right? Yeah. So like I said before, if you if you go at the goosebumps methodology of choose your own adventure, this is why a script doesn't always work, right? Or most of the time doesn't work because based on how they answer a question, you a script isn't going to be 100% accurate on what you say next. If, if you ask them, hey, you know, how's business been? Is this are you guys looking like you're hitting your busy season? And then if they're like, yes, versus no, you're going to answer, you're going to respond to them Two differently. Different ways. Right? Yeah. Or on top of that, if you get a, if you, if you ask a question and it does give you like a very short answer versus a long answer, the short answer, you're probably like, all right, well that didn't work. So let me pivot and ask a different question. That's broad where I can pull information. But if they give you a, they divulge a lot of information to you, you got to latch on to something they said and you want to drill down deeper and start to really get into whatever whatever's going on there. So if you pick up on the fact that, yeah, it's been really busy and we just had three trucks fall, fall out yesterday, boom, I'm I'm latching on to that and I'm going down to the fallouts and figuring out, you know, why did that happen? Or if it's, hey, our busy season is coming up in a few months. Oh, great. I'm going to hop on that. And what does it look like for, you know, do you guys have a bid process or what is your, what does it look like for you guys to, to approve new transportation providers? Right. Yeah. Like that's the end of the road, right? If I can get down that detailed and they're willing to divulge that much information, that's exactly where you're going all the way to the path of. Yep. 
how do we get onboarded? What are the procurement requirements? What's the process look like? How many people are involved in the decision-making process? Are you one of them? Is it a group of people? Is it one person? How long does it take, right? Those are all of the things we really need to know, but you're never going to lead with. Yep. Probably and not even going to get this like your fourth or fifth call. <laughs> say it's not going to happen on every call, right? You could have someone that you, you're calling six months before their busy season. And it's one of those like, hey, I, you know, I just, I really just wanted to reach out, introduce myself and um, plant the seed with you guys. I know mm-hmm. things are going to be bumping up here or ramping up for you guys in, in about four to six months. And, um, just want, you know, just wanted to introduce myself and, you know, go from there. It's, it could be a very short two, three minute call and they're probably not going to remember it, but you've got at least some kind of rapport established and level of comfort on your end that the next phone call is no longer a cold call. Right. So and that's the biggest thing. Right. And that's what I wanted to like, kind of even maybe wrap up on is that like the timeline that you should expect to bring them on again, is like eight to 12 conversations over a period of like two to three months, right? Expect them not to really remember you when you call them the second or third time until you've spoken with them three or four times, they probably don't remember you. Right? So my first few calls are almost identical. My first and second call, I might even speak exactly the same, go through the same things. They don't usually remember. And I just try to go a little bit farther, learn a little bit more. Right? My goal is not really to get business in the first few calls because I don't expect to. Right? I feel like a good analogy is like, that'd be like asking every person you've ever gone on one date with if they want to marry you and if they want to have children, right? Like you're way premature at this point to be asking these questions. And that's why your people are so frustrated when they're new because they're like, well, hey, I'm not getting any business on the first call I made and I feel like I'm just getting rejected. Well, they don't know you. They don't trust you. So expect to stretch this out over a month or two period. And like your point, you don't need to get it all in one conversation. Leave some ammunition for the next call too, right? Be able to get out of the call before they're tired of talking to you. Yeah. So um, we talk about objections a lot, right? If you are the broker that hops on and you're like, hey, I work for ABC Logistics and I'm wondering how we can get set up with your company. Like you just ran right to the finish line and they're just going to throw you a million objections because they're like, what? Like you just caught like you could smell a cold call. And I mean, that is like very, very obvious if you go ahead and do that. Um, Even the we have trucks in the area is better than that one. Um, I mean, yeah. like you say, the first 500,000 or whatever calls you make, it's really to, to fine tune your craft and get comfortable and just learn how to talk on the phone to people that you have never talked to before. Right. Like that would be the same as like you getting a cold call and them saying, Hey Nate, how do I sign you up for dish network today? And you're like, well, one, I don't know if I want dish network. I never even did like I don't know that I want that. I don't know what it costs. I wouldn't do it anyway. I'm happy with my provider. Why are you like all of it is off putting, right? Yep. Absolutely. So good stuff. Good conversation. Hope you, you guys can get, you know, take something out of that. Um, we do have some good uh, Q and a questions today, but first I got to give a shout out to our friends over at lean lean solutions group is the industry leader in near shore staffing solutions with offices in South America, including freight broker back office operations, accounting, tech development, business development, marketing, customer service, and many other positions. To learn more about the vast solutions that Lean has to offer your freight brokerage or agency, visit them online at www.leangroup.com. And don't forget with Lean, uh, it's not just the the staffing side, right? We had somebody reach out asking about um, building a website and Lean Tech, that division, can assist with uh, website and anything on the IT side. Like they built our website, and I think they did a great job. Um, it was a ple- it's been a pleasure working with them, and we still do. So, all right, cool. Uh, first question: Is there a TMS that allows me to integrate multiple LTL brokerages to compare pricing? Uh, and I shortened that because what the guy had asked was he doesn't he hates having to go to multiple platforms to try and get a price. So. I just told him the short answer is no, but I gave him some insight. So like if you are, let's talk LTL just briefly, right? There's, let's say there's, you're, you got 10 or 12 really strong LTL national carriers, right? Your XPO, your Roadrunner, uh, Old Dominion, UPS, right? You got, and you've got some regional ones that operate in certain areas. So yes, there is a way to get, pricing on all of those in an aggregate area. But in my answer, that would be like, yeah, go to an LTL brokerage, right? And they're going to, they're going to provide you with all their contracted LTL rates based on whatever their discount is set up at. 
But to compare brokerage against brokerage, I don't know of any place that's going to take, like, can you go to a website and see what the current price of a Big Mac versus a uh, Whopper versus a Baconator is? Like, I mean, maybe somebody yeah. put it together, but no, there's not like a, it's not like Expedia or Travelocity where you can get all the, you know, I don't know. So no, but there's not, but there are some cool tools out there that do aggregate pricing for you. And that could be a brokerage, like an LTL brokerage. Um, there's like Project 44, I know has done some stuff in the LTL space. I feel like you've showed me something though. I feel like we were looking at it one time and you could see all the different carriers and their rates compared against each other. Well, yeah, that's just that's just a brokerage or yeah. it's either a brokerage or a third party aggregating the actual carrier rates. But this guy was asking how he can compare brokerages Oh, uh, I got you. And I'm like, no, because you're, the brokerages are taking their specific pricing from that LTL carry, which those prices aren't going to be the same. And then they're adding their margin, which their margin is not always going to be the same. So, no, there's not. Interesting question, yep. though. Next one. I love this next one. Should I stop corresponding with a carrier if they are rude or ignore instructions when I'm, when I'm setting them up? Um, for the most part, yes, but de it depends. Like if they're <laughs> yeah, it could be the only carrier available to save your customer's butt on a Friday and like, you're going to have to put up with a rude driver to get your customer taken care of. But in general, I don't like doing business with carriers that are just blatantly mean. Um, I'm not like trigger happy when it comes to blacklisting carriers, but we will definitely do it at, at Pierce if a carrier is rude or treats our especially if they treat our our staff bad it's one thing to get into it with a broker over a specific situation that the two of you are dealing with but to then be pissed off and treat an accounting rep or someone that's trying to help yeah. you out treat them disrespectfully hell no man i think the only thing i mean the only caveat is everybody has a bad day i mean when i run into this i usually just call it out and that usually eliminates it you know what i mean I'm like yeah. hey <laughs> like there's an old saying like, hey, someone shit your cornflakes this morning, right? Just anything <laughs> to kind of crack their smile. And usually they'll be like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I had a rough day. Don't take it personally. But again, if they are unresponsive, like that's a completely different thing. I mean, if they're not responding to things, maybe they're busy, but if you're setting them up and you can't get a hold of them, that's not boding well for your relationship. Yeah. So I'll give you like examples of some that <clears throat> we deal with on a somewhat frequent basis. I don't like, it's not a lot, but it's often enough that it, it's happened enough times that I can say I've seen it as a trend is like a carrier that you send out a carrier packet and it's a packet that can be completed in 30 seconds online and signed and 30 minutes goes by and you haven't gotten it back. Or part of your process involves send me a copy of your insurance certificate because it's not listed on a sure assist or safer watch or whatever. And an hour goes by and they haven't done it. If you got a hot load and you got another driver that's willing to, to do it, yeah, I'm gonna tell this guy like, "Hey, man, I'm sorry." Or I've yeah. had people where like I've had a, we had carriers that like they um, customer cancels a load and you know it's I don't know far enough in advance that you're not gonna pay a tonu and they're like. Yeah. This is BS. Your broker is, they just found a cheaper carrier and they're screwing me over, blah, blah, blah. It's like, that's not true. Like, yes, some people do that and that does exist, but that's not how we operate. And if it, if that was the case, we would still pay you a tonu because that's bad on our driver's part or on our broker's part. But to just start making accusations, I've seen like the emails are hilarious when they have terrible, like, right. They're good at driving a truck, but they're not the best at running a professional or like respectful email. And it's just like them going off a rant behind the keyboard, pissed off about this, that other thing. It's like, yeah, like, I'm sorry you feel that way. And you felt the need to be an a-hole about it, but yeah. uh, this is just the way that it is. And, you know, we're not going to, we're going to choose to not do business with your company moving forward. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's subjective situation, you know, the angles, all that stuff, it all just kind of depends on the situation. So. Yep. When in doubt, if I have the choice to work with a nice carrier versus someone that's going to be rude or just not pay attention to me, then yeah, I'm going to choose the one that's better to work with. So, kind of the same thing with brokers and customers, right? Sometimes a customer might work with a broker out of necessity, and then the first chance they get to find somebody else because you know they they don't want to work with a hole Jimmy that 
sure he had a truck available, but he was a real cocky dick about it. And um, yeah. So, all right, last question. Does the name of my company matter? Overall, no, but there's a caveat. <laughs> I've seen Depends some- on how bad your name <laughs> is. <laughs> It was like offensive company names. Yes. There was one, no joke. Like, you can't make this up. There was an MC, like somebody just emailed me the one day and was like, yo, look up this MC number. And it was like, I after your mother trucking LLC. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But it was spelled like different enough that like the yeah. FSDSA definitely didn't catch it if they have automated software to like, like I E F F E D. But it was, <laughs> yeah, it was something. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And if you're a broker, you definitely don't want to be like, no, you know, going down that road. But like, yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter if your no. company's name is something logistics or something express <clears throat> or trucking or whatever. They, everyone pretty much uses the same common words to name their brokerage. So yeah, it doesn't really matter. What matters is you and how you can be effective on the phone with the customers and how you treat your carriers. Absolutely. Uh, have you seen any any good uh, company names that stuck out to you? No, I wish I did. I'm like, I know I've seen some that are that are pretty bad. I wish I had some examples I could have brought. But You know what I thought was interesting is I've seen brokers that will use an LLC that they created from a completely different industry. And they like I've seen brokers that they set up using like a real like it was like ABC Realty, and I'm yeah. like, why? Why is that your brokerage name? They're like, ah, oh, just you know, I had the LLC, I just kept it. And it's like, all right, that's you might want to change that. Like those yeah. are ones that like, yeah, it could matter because it just it kind right. of comes across as not as really you, relevant. Exactly. But if you're not in either of those categories, I think you're all right. If it's not yeah. offensive and it's somewhat relevant, you're good. It's a pretty low bar for naming your company. Yeah, exactly. And I, hey, a lot of times you don't even have to give the name of your company on those first calls. Just give your name. Like, hey, I'm right. John. They don't care. Yep. So, yep. Cool. Good stuff, man. Uh, let's see what we got in the NFL this weekend. Steelers, Dolphins, please squish the fish. I'm, uh, I know Miami's going to be a favorite in that game, but I'll be rooting for the Steelers. I think you guys can hold on to it close. Yeah, we'll uh, see. The question is, is Tua back? Uh, I don't yes. remember. Is I it? think okay. he's out of the pro, the, the concussion, protocol, stuff. concussion protocol. They were talking about this morning. They said, I think they have a, two tackles or one or two tackles that were injured too. They were talking about this morning. They said if either of them are out, Pittsburgh, they think has a shot. But Yeah, and if, if Tua doesn't stay healthy during the game too, like he he's an injury-prone yeah. player. So it happened to him in college and um, clearly – it's happened to him in the NFL. Um, the, the four and two Jets against the two and four Broncos. I hate to see the Jets get a win, but I I think they uh, I think they can pull that one off. It's going to be a really boring game to watch, though. I think. I think. I'll be honest, man. I think Russell Wilson sucks. I think he's a trash quarterback from what he was when he won the Super Bowl. Yeah. But uh, we shall see. Yeah, Thursday night this week, Saints Cardinals. Both two and four. Monday night, Bears, Patriots. I think the Patriots are pretty mediocre this year, too. Yeah, all right. Chiefs, 49ers. You never know. Could uh wait, wasn't that the that was the Super Bowl matchup when Mahomes won, wasn't it? Chiefs 49ers or am I crazy? Like four years ago? I remember. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember either. Okay, whatever. Well, uh, what's the weather forecast looking like for you guys? It can warm up by the end of the week or what? Nah, it's supposed to stay like this, like high 60s, 70s. It's actually mm. pretty nice. I'm enjoying some fall weather. There you go. We're supposed to see potentially 70 degrees by Sunday. And we, I have so many leaves in my yard right now, and it's been raining, so I need to just let them dry out and get out there and cl- clean those leaves up. I think I'm just going to use my my like lawnmower. And I got a bag around it. I'm just going to just run through there and just i used to just put the mulching blade on mine and just chop them all up it's yeah good for yeah, one anyway I don't, have, I don't have the mulching kit for it but may, maybe worth the uh the purchase for next year we'll see cool man any uh oh, what do we got coming up here so next was we're gonna next? have a great interview with um next week we're gonna be i don't know when it's gonna air but we're gonna be doing it with um one of the larger shippers in the country so we're gonna be talking with paul estrada 
he's been on freight waves a few times um and he's i think he's back with them with niagara bottling so one of the larger shippers in the country we're going to talk to like what he looks for how he perceives cold calls and dig into what it's like from the other side of this table yep that's a uh that's a do not miss and then um next week we will be having um, Blue Book back on with us, I believe. So we'll be talking yep. through the claims process. So produce claims, I believe. Yep. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Well, cool, man. Any uh, any closing final thoughts here? Yeah, I haven't really talked about this much, but I'm going to be working with agents as well. So if anyone else is looking to come on as an agent as well, you can come reach out to me. Um with business to business logistics, you can reach out to me at my email, Benjamin at freight360.net, or you can email me there at Benjamin at shipbtb.com. There you go. Look at us taking care of agents. Yep. One at a time. Good stuff, man. Any, uh, any, you don't, you didn't give us a proverb today. I did not. You should have like a phrase. You know, oh no, you did give us the, the someone shit in your cornflakes. We'll call that. Oh, we'll man. call that your phrase for the day. <laughs> Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode, and make sure to visit us online at freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. And if you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the contact us form on our site and we'll see you next week.